So. Shouting is not argument, but don't the scientists have all these fancy computer models that do explain and predict everything? Well, yes and no. They have fancy computer models that infallibly predict disaster because that's what they're programmed to do. But they can't explain this evidence, not of the last 500 million years, not of the last 50 million, the last 5 million, or of the last 5,000. And I want to emphasize again that the things that we're looking at here are hidden in plain sight. They're not state secrets, including that after the disappearance of the non-avian dinosaurs, a warm earth continued to be very hospitable to animal life. You get the flowering of the mammals. And I know, you know, the mammals really can't get no respect, no matter how big and spectacular and weird they get, because they're never as big, spectacular, and weird as the dinosaurs. But things like the rhinoceros-like Arsinoetherium and the vaguely elephantine Dinotherium flourished in the warm world between the extinction of the dinosaurs and the coming of the ice. And it's interesting to look at the way news stories treat some of this, including a couple of very alarming ones about the so-called Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, a sudden temperature spike that happened about 55 million years ago, lasting about 200,000 years. Now, the Paleocene, by the way, or old recent, is the first epoch following the end of the dinosaurs within the Paleogene period of the Cenozoic era. Uh, but don't worry, there won't be a test, at least not on that. What there is a test on, though, is this. The news stories depict this as a disastrous period, a huge release of CO2 causing mass extinctions, and also they say it's an analogy for the present period. The Globe and Mail recently reported on, quote, a study that offers a cautionary message to global policymakers, end quote. Why? Because, quote, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, PETM, offers the best-known natural analog to human-induced global warming. The cause of the PETM is a matter of debate, but evidence suggests it is linked to a massive infusion of carbon into the ocean and atmosphere. Possible theories include volcanic eruptions or a comet impact. In the Washington Post's even more hair-raising version, in the blink of an eye, geologically speaking, thousands of gigatons of carbon were released into the atmosphere. The global temperature rose by as many as 8 degrees Celsius. The oceans became more acidic. Sea levels surged upward. Hundreds of species went extinct. Sound familiar? Um, no, not really, but the story goes on, quote, this catastrophic period in Earth's history is the best analog we have to the climate change that is happening today. Uh, but there were no humans around burning fossil fuels in the year 55.6 million before present. Primates had only just evolved. So what could have caused atmospheric carbon and global temperatures to spike so dramatically? In the journal Science on Thursday, researchers report the discovery of tiny glass globules in rock core samples as far apart as New Jersey and Bermuda, which they believe may be evidence of an ancient catastrophic comet impact that set off the period of global warming. Now you see the problem here. They're arguing that this past event is exactly like the present because it's completely different. There were no humans then. There hasn't been a huge comet impact recently. Temperature also has not shot up by 8 degrees centigrade, nor do even the most frightening of the alarmist models suggest that it's about to do so in our own time. But there's something else that's very significant about all of this. BBC Radio 4's In Our Time program talked about the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, and it too tried to pin it on a sudden release of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, but it went on to stress that this warm period corresponded with not mass extinctions, but a crucial flowering of mammals. But what, what is lovely is that there aren't any extinctions on land that we've found. What happens, though, during the PETM, just the environments expand, and so evolution just goes mad. And so the mammals go, hey, we've inherited the Earth from the dinosaurs, 55 million years, it's really warm, it's really humid, this is fantastic. Bam! And so you get all these wonderful new mammals, uh, from whales all the way through to camels, uh, primates, as I said. And again, it's a shame because everybody focuses on the KT boundary and the death of the non-avian dinosaurs. But really, for mammal evolution and our history, really everything kicks off at um, sort of 55 million years. By the way, Wikipedia also says, and I quote, Although it is now widely accepted that the PETM represents a, quote, case study, end quote, for global warming and massive carbon input to Earth's surface, the cause, details, and overall significance of the event remain perplexing. Well, if it's a case study for global warming, what it's showing us is that we don't know anything about that past period. If we don't know why it happened, we don't know what happened, and we don't know what it means, we really can't claim to know a whole lot. And the same thing may well be true of more recent periods. So. Now what we're going to do is zoom in 
even more. See what comes into sharper focus when we move from 500 million and 50 million years ago to just 5 million or even less, to what most of us think of when we hear the term Ice Age, unless we think of that dang movie. We've seen a flourishing of mammals in this warmer Earth. There were snakes the size of a bus, maybe that's a bad thing, but there were also camels in Ellesmere Island. But again, you look at the way news stories treat this. We get, in this case, the Ottawa Citizen, reporting that the scientists who found the remains of this camel say, quote, the mid-Pliocene is a historical analog for future warming. It is a potentially very important time for understanding processes in the high Arctic and getting our heads around what might be happening next and how fast it might happen. Okay, I'm game. In May of 2015, NBC reported in the usual breathless fashion, quote, global levels of carbon dioxide, the most prevalent heat trapping gas, have passed a daunting milestone, federal scientists say. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says in March, the monthly global average for carbon dioxide hit 400.83 parts per million. That is the first month in modern records that the entire globe broke 400 parts per million, reaching levels that haven't been seen in about 2 million years. Quote, it's both disturbing and daunting, end quote, said NOAA chief greenhouse gas scientist Peter Tons. Okay, so why is it disturbing that we had these levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as we did 2 or 3 million years ago? Well, presumably because they herald a runaway greenhouse effect. We might even get James Hansen's boiling oceans. But what is it that actually happened? last time we had these levels of CO2 in the atmosphere on what is already a warmer planet than we have today. Right, a sudden inexplicable series of glaciations. If you look at this chart, you see two things. There's this short run pattern of these endless little peaks and valleys that apart from regularly succeeding one another, don't really have a predictable pattern of timing or extent. But then halfway through, about two and a half million years ago, something else happens, quite unrelated, unpredictable, but sustained a fall of temperature into what is in fact an ice age properly defined. That is a baffling series of many glaciations and interglacials that again has that weird quality of being almost regular and yet being chaotic within the regularity or vice versa and also being subject to sudden changes in its almost regularity. And the third thing you see again is thank goodness we're at this peak on the far right or we wouldn't be here with computers and Gore-Tex and elevators and microwaves. According to one book I read around 1993 on a completely different topic, there have been 17 major glaciations in the last 1.7 million years and eight during the last 730,000 years. At the peak glaciation, nearly a third of the Earth's surface was covered by ice sheets and the sea level dropped by 400 to 500 feet. Now you may have noticed a discrepancy there. That book that I cited said 17 in 1.7 million years and I had said two and a half million years. And it's a reminder not to regard the science as settled, even on points like this. What happened is that the boundary between the warmer Pliocene and the colder Pleistocene for a long time was thought to be at 1.7 million years ago. But then, in 2009, confirmed by the International Union of Geological Sciences, they officially moved the boundary. And they think there maybe have been 23 glaciations rather than 17. We're still dealing with reconstructions here more precise to be sure than when we're looking back 300 million years ago, but still requiring a lot of interpretation. And that's why when you look at this kind of thing, the more precision you demand, the less you get.